Photoshop 4 is the correct one. Uh, we'll be talking about Efficiency 4 today and the presenter for this afternoon is Lionel C. Lionel C is our presenter. And we're going to divide the workshop. This is how you're going to go. So I'm just going to explain a little bit, right? First, um, Pastor Lionel will be presenting uh, the framework of what he's going to be discussing in the first, first half of the workshop. Then we'll open up the floor for discussion, right? There'll be discussion time, Q&A time. So how the Q&A is going to work is you will have to submit your questions via type form. Like you have to type out your questions in the chat box of the Zoom directly to me. You can't, you can't just post it out to everyone. You have to post it to me, uh, private message me in the, in the chat box all your questions, I will collate all the questions, and then I will ask those questions on behalf of all of you to Lionel, and then we'll go forth, go forth from there. Okay, so just remember that we will have a short time of just presentation, and during the presentation time, I would uh, ask that all of us mute our mic, mute our mic, uh, so that you, there, no, there won't be any uh, noise pollution. So your, your cooperation, your, your help is much appreciated. And so before we start, shall we have a word of prayer? I'll invite all of you to please bow your heads with me and then we will pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here on this Sabbath afternoon to attend this workshop. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit dwell upon all of us because only you can grant us understanding. Use Pastor Lionel, speak through him, but Lord, more importantly, speak to our hearts in areas that we are stubborn, in areas that we are refusing your conviction. So Lord, as you convict us, as you help us understand, lead us along the way of growth, because Lord, you want to be a more faithful disciple of yours. You want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So now I hand the time over to Lionel. All right. Uh, hang on. Let me share my... Done. Okay. Can you guys see? Thumbs up if you can see the presentation screen. All good. All right. So... Today's workshop is entitled From More Hierarchy to More Missionaries. Now, just in the title alone, um, it, is, uh, it is not an easy title. It's a title that will challenge all of us, especially uh, if you work for the church, uh, a lot to think about. And as I was going through this material again and again, um, a lot of things became clear, right? So um, I look forward to your questions and your discussion. This is not really just for your information. And um, that's something I really believe in. That as a disciple, we are called not just to learn more, but to apply more. And so um, that's my hope that every one of you here in this workshop, uh, after you've learned this, um, practice it and uh, try to develop your skills so that um, like, like today's message, right, we become a more full body of Christ. Um, so let's start with our pain point that I preached about this morning to 0.27% of our KPI. That is our current status. Uh, in Singapore, the percentage is 0.0006%. So we have our work cut out for us. As far as effectiveness is concerned, um, I dare say that we are not effective. We may have the knowledge, we may have something new and something fresh and something, um, we, we have revelations, we have prophecy, we have so much to put on the table as far as the Christian church as a whole is concerned. Um, but so little know about it, 0.0006%. And so today, um, table of contents, I'm just going to introduce APES, um, what it really means, um, go through the whole thing really briefly, and then I want to talk about some assumptions to have uh, with regards to APES. What are the benefits? Uh, what are the challenges? So the ABCs, and then we'll spend some time with application, and that's when after that um, we'll open the floor for questions. And so if you have a question during Q and A, um, so that's after the whole thing, you can just put a Q number in the chat: one, two, three, four, five and uh, you, you'll, you'll be able to unmute your mic and ask your question, all right? So um, during the presentation, just message your, um, your questions to James directly. So without further ado, I'll begin. APES, what is APES? Well, APES really came from this part of the Bible, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, 11 to 12, where 
um, because of this word sum uh, is no longer understood as a laity and a clergy kind of divide. But if some, re some refers to the full body, then that means all of us as disciples have some of these gifts. We may have one or two, um, but we will never have all because only Jesus has all manifested perfectly and fully. And so this is um, the context where it came from. And if you want to know more about this, you can pick this book up. It's called 5Q. This is actually our curriculum for church growth class in seminary. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, picking up a, um, in a lot of um, churches, not just in our denomination, but Christian-wide. Right? This book um, is, is hot cake, basically. And um, the speaker is Alan Hirsch. He's not Adventist. But what we are sharing is not about Adventism. It's, it's just biblical, right? And in the book, he talks about these five types. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. So these five. And um, like I shared earlier, the apostles are those that are really good in pioneering and they can catalyze. The prophets are those that are really good at exposing weaknesses, flaws, sins, and uh, they embody what they want most is for God's will to be embodied in the church, in reality. And then the evangelists, they are amazing at inviting. Uh, you will be able to see some in your church, right? They can invite 10, they can invite 20 people, they can invite their whole class, they can invite all their colleagues. They are constantly inviting. They are able to move people along with a movement. Um, it's just natural for them. And wherever they go, they create excitement. And then there's the shepherding. Um, they are really good at nurturing. They are caring. They are nice. They will sit down with you for a whole afternoon. They will sit through your problems with you. Those are the shepherds. And then there are the teachers. They are, they are super good at just passing information down, repackaging information, reinterpreting information uh, so that it becomes digestible and easily understood. So these are the five archetypes. Okay? And just to briefly explain, so apostles, extremely good at extending the gospel. They are a translation of faith from one context to the other. So they are very good at seeing, hey, like let's say when circuit breaker happened, they were like, oh, we have no church building. How can we go virtual? They are the ones that every single problem becomes an opportunity for change, for growth, for leverage. So in the real world, you will see some apostles make really good entrepreneurs because every problem is an opportunity to get something, to gain new ground. They are always thinking of the future. They live in the future. Uh, they love to bridge barriers. And so they like to connect um, different facets together. They are into developing leaders and they love networking trans locally. So not within the church, but they believe the church can network out. And so these are the guys, right? But one of the weaknesses of apostles, they can come across uncaring. It's all about achieving. It's all about moving forward. It's all about breaking new ground. So for those that are afraid of change, you might, you might come to contention with these guys because they're like, change, let's go forward. Um, get out of your comfort zone. So these are the guys. And um, they are always into constant change. So if you have a strong leader like that, He's constantly coming out with new ideas to the point that sometimes it gets frustrating. It's like, hey, can we just develop one and be good at it for a while? Let us give us a break. Let us settle down. So these are apostles, uh, weaknesses. The other one is the organization and people can feel uncared for and used uh, because everyone can seem like an asset, right? You are good in this, go do this. You are good in this, do this. Hey, how about how I feel? It's like, uh, let's break new ground first, then we'll talk about how you feel. Okay, so these are apostles. Um, one really strong example was Paul. Paul was, is a hard man to work with. Is he loving? He is. But he's not easy to work with, and he's constantly on the move. He's constantly trying to push boundaries. Um, so let's go to prophets. Prophets know God's will. Um, they are attuned to God and His truth, and they like to challenge dominant assumptions of culture. So they are someone that constantly 
uh, least in this paradigm of what does God want? What does God want? They love to question the status quo and they always insist community follow God's command. So this is something. Um, but what happens if they are the only ones that are in church? Um, they can become belligerent activists, right? And they only live in an ideal world. So they become disengaged from reality. And these guys can easily move into um, what, quote-unquote, we call emo mode. They're always unhappy with the church. They always smile like that. Ah, nothing seems good enough and comes across that perfectionistic. And uh, paradoxically, they actually lose connection to those that really need to listen. Because those that need to listen feel like they're never good enough. So this is the weakness and strengths. Um, next will be the evangelists. So evangelists are super recruiters. They are infectious communicators, sensitive right now. Uh, they draw believers to engage in church ministries and different activities. So they are the ones that can recruit. Um, they will be the best people if nominating committee or decide, right? Ask the recruiter to go and ask the people. They will give you the results really easily, right? These recruiters, uh, evangelists, are not shy at all. And they are focused on reaching the loss. So these are evangelists. Um, what are their weaknesses? Evangelists are not so interested in nurturing current talent. There are those that are also out there they are those that are used to being the limelight and they are pulling and calling. So they're always attention grabbing, but they always tend to neglect local work. So similar, slightly similar to apostles, apostles want to do the work that's out, want to expand the work. Uh, evangelists are all about pulling people in, but the local work, the grand work, normally they are not so interested in that. It's just the, the archetype, right? And then we have shepherds. And uh, just a sideline, in our church right now, the way we are set up, 70% of us are probably shepherds and teachers because that's just how our community is, right? So they love to nurture and protect their shepherds. They are amazing caregivers. They are focused on maturity and protection of God's flock. Uh, every, they care about how, how the people in church feel greatly. They love and they, they naturally create loving relationships. They are great at nurturing disciples. And um, what are their weaknesses? They will always value stability to the detriment of mission. Let's not rock the boat because then people will not feel cared for. So that's stuff they think about. They will tend to foster unhealthy dependence between church and themselves. Um, people that are strong shepherds you know, when, when you have to put down a ministry to move to another, your heart will feel naturally a bit heart pain. So this is one of the telltale signs if you want to know whether you're strong in shepherding side, right? And um, next, teachers. They are extremely good at understanding and explaining. explaining. They help members retain, um, be biblically grounded. So they are the ones that will challenge, hey, where do you find that from scripture? That's a good idea, but um, where do you get that from? They are guide when looking for wisdom. So teachers are really good when you need clarity on a certain thing. And they are great at constructing transferable doctrines. So they can repackage doctrines, not make it boring and move it to application, teaching. That's also one of our strengths of Adventist church. We are great at teaching. If you listen to Adventist sermons as compared to any other denomination sermons, it's a little different. Why? We tend to be able typically to unpack verses and deliver it super well, like a lecture, right? But what are weaknesses? We fall into dogmatism or dry intellectualism. Our application is not as important as theory. We like to discuss about theory, doctrine. We can talk about it whole afternoon. Uh, application is not so important. And we fail to see personal or missional aspects of the church. So these will be the strengths and weaknesses for all the five types. And, um, okay. and so this is a picture. When our church started, it was a movement. 
all five were present in our church. If you study our church history, you look at the profile of our church leaders and what they did. We were a movement and all five were together. But today, it's different. Our structure seems to be narrowed downwards and um, teachers and pastors are the main proponents in our church today. Um, so we have seminary that teach. I don't think it's just seminary. It could be pastors that's teaching. You know, you have afternoon classes, you have Bible study classes. Everything is a study. And then you have pastors to shepherd, to look after, to nurture, to mentor. That's it. And then you have the evangelists, right? Typically, um, if you wonder why evangelists always go personal ministry, something to think about, you know, perhaps our hierarchy is not ready to cater to the giftings of an evangelist that they know they cannot, they will not stay in, in one territory, right? Their job is to go around and to help. So prophets, um, for a denomination that had a prophet, we sent her away to Australia. The General Conference couldn't stand her. So they shipped her to Australia. They're like, please leave us alone so we can build an empire. Um, there was one. So everyone thinks they want a prophet. But trust me, you don't really want a prophet because truth hurts. Okay? And then next, apostles, which is something that church planting is now um, into just a department in our church. James, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's true. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, just a change of voice. I think that's that's the key challenge. I think for for the church right now, I uh, haven't seen different experience different churches. Uh, don't know about you, Lino. That uh, indeed, as you said, I think our church is very teacher centric or pastor centric. Even the pastor, even as uh, even in the seminary, we hear about they like to define pastors as teachers more than pastors. And I think the scary thing for me as a pastor is that uh, we're not only expected to be the pastor, the teacher, we're expected to be the evangelist, the prophet, and the apostle, all at the same time, every time. Uh, is that your experience, Rhino? Yeah, definitely. So effectively, if we, we go back to the verse, right, we understand the verse that some, only, I will never have all five strong. No one of us will. Only Jesus has. Then, we cannot expect one person to fulfill all five. <laughs> cannot, <right>? man. <laughs> and, and even in seminary, when we did our gifting, and later on, I'll actually give you a link. You can download the APES gifting, and you can do it for yourself. So you, you find out what your gifting is, and I hope you develop uh, that strength, that gift that you have. 80% of our seminaries were all shepherding and teaching. Mm. Um, my hypothesis is that the evangelists, well, that the evangelists, the prophets, the apostles, they have probably been drawn more into the corporate, more into the professional or the independent ministries or whatever you call that, right? They start out a company that helps churches and stuff like that. We see that, or they can create an affiliated uh, missional program. But you will hardly see someone in our church right now say, I'm an apostle. I, I just go around planting church. Uh, I have not heard of one person yet. Um, so there's something for us to think about. Um, and I, for, for this, I, I mean, while we're here at this slide, I'm, I don't want to just talk about church employment and church roles. I think within our own local church, um, we will see that teachers and carers are the most prominent ones in the church, generally. Those that are more evangelistic, yeah, maybe, but they are few. And a lot of them, especially in the young adult, when we did our young adult profiling, we have very little people that will be strategic, good communicators and stuff like that. They are the minority in our church right now. And uh, perhaps, you know, our church just cannot interest them. So if they have to develop their gifting, they will actually start to move out of the church. Like someone that's good in business, you know, he's not, he, he might not start a Christian, a, a Christian enterprise or, or whatever, you know, he, he might be more drawn to just moving up into the corporate. 
Yeah. So, so this you're saying, is. Hmm? So you're saying that uh, our structure is limiting the the manifestation of different gifts. Is that what you're saying? So um, this is a very dangerous uh, <laughs> question to ask, James. Set you up right there. Thanks. Uh, I would say the question we have with our structure is this. God gives us the gifts. We don't get to choose in a way, right? So the thought process should be, is the structure supporting the gifts? Or you can think of it from your local church. Is the way your church functions supporting the giftings that God has given to your members? And if you're a church leader, then ask yourself, are you asking the question, more often than not, how can the church support my member in becoming better and better and better at their gift? I think it should be that, that, um, that train of thought. Rather than right now, I think sometimes we get caught in the, we will come up with something and then we try to get all our members to squeeze into that paradigm. Whereas the paradigm should be defined by the giftings. Because we have the Great Commission. We are actually really clear on what the church needs to do. We don't need to redefine it. Mm. Yeah. So, so. Okay. So, so I'm interested. Lino, what's, uh, what's your APES profile? My APES profile? Mm -hmm. Well, um, when I took it, I took it again. Just because I didn't like it. But the answer was the same. Uh, my A press profile, my top is apostolic. Ah, my right. second is prophetic. <laughs> and um, so when I look at church structure, like when COVID-19 happened and I looked, I was like, I was telling James, did you know church planting has the lowest cost or barrier to entry right now because of COVID-19? You need a camera, you need a mic, you need uh, lights, I don't know. That's all you need. And your congregation potential is the same as any other church, in a way. Think about it, right? Whereas be pre-COVID-19, you have to think of renting a space, you have to think of um, a lot of things. So that's how the apostolic mind works. Uh, prophetic, well, um, I don't justify. I think I... Yeah, it, it, just, it just dawned on me that perhaps um, the problems that I see in our church just becomes more painfully clear. I thought it was just me, like I have, and so I keep telling myself, complain less, right? Stop being dissatisfied with, with what the church can do and just learn to be satisfied, learn to love what we have, learn to. So that was what I've been telling myself for the past, since I was in ministry, so 10 over years. And then when I took that, I was like, oh, perhaps that is why. Um, so James, what's your, what's your gifting? Uh, first of all, I'm like, I'm gonna just going to say, so you mean your gifts are not shepherding and teaching? <laughs> uh, no. <There's, laughs> but I, I would like to preface this. It doesn't mean I need to stop being uncaring sure. or, or that. Yeah, but it's just not the first thought on my mind. I think as a pastor saying that, I feel like, you know, endangered. Uh, but that's really <laughs> not the first thing on my mind. The first thing when I see a problem is how can we do better? How can we push further? How can we, um, you know, develop a new ministry? How can we, uh, is this ministry working? Uh, if not, um, how, how can we change it? So that's the stuff that fills my mind most of the time. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, for me, I'll share my, my gifting. <laughs> my, my shepherding is actually my, my second lowest gift. <laughs> so sorry as that. Um, my highest gift is evangelistic. And uh, my second gift, which is very close, is uh, teaching. That's my two top gifts. Uh, again, uh, yeah, shepherding is quite low in my, in my list. So I'm like you. I, uh, I'm not a natural, typical uh, Adventist pastor profile. Yeah, and uh, working with James in Young Adult Ministry is, is very obvious. Uh, uh, for both of us, when we work together, 
thank goodness we have other counterparts that are really strong in shepherding and then they will come in and say, but how would this person feel? And then we're like, oh yeah, okay, let's take a step back. Uh, but that just shows that we need one another more, right? I agree, I can't agree more. And I think that's, that's what God is gifting the church, of course. Uh, we're not limited to this profile. I, I, I have seen sometimes that my friends who are pastors, their profile changes depending on their context. Mm. There are some who, because of uh, they go off to far away, uh, challenging missionary fields, God actually elevate all their gifts really high for that period of time. And then when he comes back to a uh, more supported environment, his gifting shifts back to where he was previously. Uh, I think, but I think in Singapore, we are gifted with a lot of supporting church members. Uh, and I think God has spread out and given all those gifts uh, equally around and not just to the pastor. Don't you think so? Totally agree. And I think one of the key points is unlocking and uh, um, I think Gary is in his chat, right? When we grew up in youth ministry, one of the key things was empowering leadership. That's one of the things that uh, I think is underutilized today. Empowering members to take up leadership, especially not just in roles, but in different aspects. You know, like, who's not cared for? Tell me. Let's do something about it. Um, okay, so let's jump into assumptions, right? The first, there are two assumptions. And from this verse, it says some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now, this five comes as a package, right? You cannot say, I only believe in apostles and prophets and I disregard the rest. They all appear in one single sentence. So it's either we accept there's a variety of giftings and it's these five or we don't accept them totally, right? That's the first assumption. It's a package deal. And the second is, is made for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry and to build the body of Christ up. That's the next phrase, edifying the body of Christ. So whatever your, your gifting is, right? It is to build the church up. If, um, I, I don't know who is in this group right now, but I know there are some that sometimes we tend to think God is calling me out to do something. But one of the ways to know that your calling might be a bit misaligned is if God is calling you out of the church to do something special. Um, that is probably not the case. Because your calling and your gifting is to build what? The church up so that the body of Christ can now, we, we don't need to live in a Stephen Hawking kind of paradigm where the mind and the brain is brilliant, but the body is paralyzed and cannot, cannot do what the brain wants to do. You get what I mean? And so the whole concept of this gifting is so the body can truly do what God wants. God is waiting for us to grow and mature and to strengthen. So this too is an assumption. We need to remember that. Okay? We don't accept all. And it's always for the work of the church is to always further the mission, the commission, the work um, basically to help the church fulfill its uh, mission. And so what are the benefits? The first is his holy state. Own self, check own self. If you check, go back to the verse, is the building of the body. And so perhaps our church as the body, right, is hurting because we only focus on certain elements right now. And so I believe that when you have all five in a healthy dynamic, it brings about a wave of healing, just like how the body recovers. And the second is that it's scalable. So if you understand this text, our body is also the temple of God. And so it's not just talking about the church, but it's also within ourselves. Um, God wants this sense that... Um, you know, to act, actually experience and to, to do these five elements. So that's why I say it's not like we disregard your weaknesses, but there are strengths that you need to work on. But understand that there are all five. It's not like because I'm not gifted in shepherding, I don't care about people anymore. That cannot be the case. Okay, so it's scalable. And uh, why is it so important? It's because 
if the model of the church and the person, the disciple attending church and in the church is scalable, then you don't run into that kind of gaps where we have to think how do we translate uh, this person's gifting into a function in a church. It should become very natural when it happens in both levels. Okay? And uh, just to show you what happens from a church level, when the apostolic strength is manifested, people see the church as an alternative society, a strong commitment to worship, prayer, spiritual warfare, holiness, justice, and incarnational witness, right? And then what is the social impact? The social impact is that we see a transformed society. We see gospel saturation. We see a church unified in purpose and mission. Um, when the prophetic function is manifested in a church, we see the church as theologically consistent, missional, engaged in all of life, culturally dynamic, high impact, organizational, adaptive, scalable, and a church planting movement. Socially, what happens? We see a restored community. Community living in covenant relationship with God, and there is a huge respect for God's presence. Evangelists, um, when they do their work, the church becomes an experience of good news. It is redemptive, it's infectiously evangelistic, culturally relevant, I think it's a big one, and always hopeful, and people movement. And socially, we will be seen as a redeemed community, we will be seen as a growing movement, a thriving society built on restored relation to God, and it's a grace economy built on sharing. So that's evangelistic. Shepherding, well, the church becomes a human community that is reconciled, healed, forgiven, and expresses itself in loving relationships. Um, it will become a reconciled community, a loving community, and the reconciliation happens across race, gender, age, nationality, right? And there will be communion in Christ. There's just this sense, very, very close sense of community. Uh, for teaching, the church will become a well-practiced community of learners with increasing self-awareness, understanding and presenting wisdom for living well. And I think we are good at this. You can, you can just from this, you, you know that this is one of our strengths. And we become a wise community. We become a kingdom of truth and loving God with mind, soul and strength. And we have this. That's why we have such strong um, Christian lifestyle um, information and stuff like that. This is one of the strengths of our church, right? But what are the challenges for doing APES and living out APES? The first is discomfort. Callings will always call you out. That's the whole point of a calling, is to call you out. Uh, and then you will have to deal with sometimes personal trust issues. And the last is you will expect opposition. So to move from a paradigm, every time we shift to a paradigm, there will always be opposition. Um, that's not how we used to do things, right? That is normal. Um, the, those with apostolic gifts are like, yes, we should push forward. Um, but think about it, if 70% of our church are shepherds, the community and not rocking the boat is actually very important. It's actually a very important value in our church right now. And perhaps that, while it's good, could become a stumbling block if we overemphasize on it and, and not try to give a balance. Right? So these are the challenges. Um, discomfort, personal trust issues, and opposition. James, do you have any others to add? When we go through challenges, I think challenges also like, is this true? Like, Pastor Lino, I've gone through so many different kind of gifts. Is this just another one? Uh, I think that's the, the paradigm that we have to think about. But I think even in many years of just being in the church, uh, the different gifts, I think at the end, put, suggest one, one similar thing that we are all gifted and gifting should be the, the thing that's leading the church, not the you know, private agenda, the plans. Uh, it should be a gift-based uh, ministry, uh, no matter which gifting you're talking about. And I don't think they actually contradict each other. 
uh, I think if you really go into the next step, you can actually uh, categorize some of our personal spiritual inventory under some of these uh, specific gifts. Uh, that's why I, I feel. Uh, the challenges will be, of course, it's going to shake things up quite a little bit. It's going to change how, it's going to go against how we're used to church. Right? The whole ministry is just going to be like, you know, quite chaotic, I think, in a transition time. And also, there's, as a leader, I think the scary thing for leaders is there's a loss of control. It seems like you don't have control over things, but I always tell myself and my leaders that you no, know, not having control and letting the Holy Spirit be in control sometimes is a lot better than uh, ourselves being in control. Because honestly, if you look at just Singapore's reality, uh, we have been in control right, for 100 years. And for 100 years, we are still at 1,300 odd attendance uh, every Sabbath. I don't think that's how the Holy Spirit works. Holy Spirit uh, exceeded that number in one day at Pentecost. So I think we have a lot more of our potential to go on. Agree, agree. And um, I think there's, there's, a, there's a beauty and, and actually lower stress from a leadership point of view, right? When you allow the Holy Spirit to determine who is good at what, um, even from a mentoring point of view, uh, all we have to do is try to hone that disciple's strength. Um, try to hone how do I make him as good as possible in what God, God has given to him. Uh, instead of like trying to make him good at something so that he can run an engine, a mission, a program or a paradigm of church that perhaps he's not passionate about, he's not interested about maybe, uh, but we keep, we keep forcing and um, from there, I think once we accept that, we look at that, then there are opportunities, right? Because now we have the freedom to create ministries where we know for sure people are actually passionate about. Because they'll come to you and say, I'm passionate about doing something of this kind of ministry. Um, whereas right now, what we do is we decide to do this kind of ministry. And then we sweep the whole church and we say, all of you, you're a member of this church and uh, we do exactly what Pastor Bayou preached about, right? We have to sometimes use turn on the guilt trip button. Eat. You have been a member of this church for so long. Remember how the church helped you support the program. Thank you. <laughs> That's how we run. Uh, and I think this is where, um, this is one of the key benefits of, of moving into this paradigm. Um, so what are the applications of APES? I just want to recap these two assumptions again, all or nothing, and to help build the church. And so applications, number one, unity in Christ is foundational. So if your walk with God is not strong, don't expect your giftings to be manifested really strongly. Yes, God might give you talents. God might give you uh, certain things that help you. But when it comes to spiritual gifting, it's a spiritual element, right? We're on spiritual warfare. So expect unity in Christ, your relational dynamic with Christ to be extremely foundational. And the second is, are you harboring a cherry sin? I think cherry sin is one of the biggest stumbling block to having an amazing ministry, uh, a ministry uh, especially for leaders. But I think everyone, now we are all called to lead in certain arenas in church, right? From, from this paradigm now. And second, start with where you are and what you have. I think this is not the time to like, hey, forget everything and let's start anew. You know, the beauty of this APES gifting is you might be a worship leader. It's got nothing to do with APES if you think about it. Some of the ministries you're in. It doesn't mean it's not important. But... Embrace your gifting. So let's say if you're shepherding, maybe you are called to be an amazing shepherd to your fellow ministry, your worship team. Care for them. Start with where you have volunteered. So if you're good in, let's say, apostleship, so you're innovating, then come up with new ways. Come up with new ways to, to sing a worship song, you know, develop, uh, improve the system. If you're prophetic, you think about, hey, is this lyrics really what? Uh, is it the best, the most suitable? So there are many ways to exercise your APES gifting, even where you are in ministry right now. 
I think that's the, uh, the, the amazing thing. It's scalable, right? So start with yourself before looking to start an organization or a whole department in church. Okay, some of you might be, but I think the confirmation is if you're willing to start where you are, um, there's a good tempering of your heart and uh, the confirmation will come. And so that brings me to point number three, seek confirmation. Your calling is not a secret that God is trying to keep. What that means is it's not something that only God knows and you know and no one else is supposed to know. And uh, so it's not like that. There will be confirmation from the rest of the church. Say, hey, I see that you're really good in this. Why don't you try that? So there's always an affirming spirit within, um, within a church body. So these are the key steps for application. And um, this is the link which you can take the test. Um, let me see if I can open it. Okay, hold on. Okay, can you all see it? I know the words are kind of small. Let me zoom in. So these are the questions, okay, that you will take. I will give you the link you can download. And then um, the tabulation is over to the side over here. Now, this is the same form that we were given in seminary, okay? So you're, you're not getting something I plucked out from the internet that looks kind of correct or something like that. This is what we did. And uh, one thing I want to share is that I got the permission of my professor to share this gifting, okay? And it's adapted from the book. So please do not disseminate it out to everyone, okay? I will get into trouble with him. I promise him I will take it down after this workshop. So I'll leave the link active and the document there for the rest of the Sabbath. So please go in after this workshop uh, download a copy and do it. And um, after tonight, I will remove it. Okay, just, just, yeah. So this is how the Excel sheet works. You just answer often, sometimes, rarely, and then you'll come up with your total over here. So the highest one is basically what you're gifted in. Uh, normally, we will take the highest two. So you have a dominant and a supporting. So mine is apostleship uh, and prophet. So that's my two. Um, okay. So let me go back in. One. I know I've shared the link for everyone in the group chat. So they should have, they should have it. Awesome. Okay. So if you didn't get the link, you can take a screenshot of this. Bitly slash DC2020 APES. Basically, that's it. Okay. If you have problems, um, you can contact me on my email. This is my email address. Okay, so you can email, I will send it to you. And uh, finally, this is one of the other ones, which is discipleship groups. Um, I think discipleship group is one of the best places to practice your APES gifting. And not just practice your APES gifting, to discover your APES gifting. So as you journey through life together in this D group, right? I think we've talked about it a lot. You get confirmation from people who walk with you through a journey. So they don't just see one facet of you, but as you continue to share your life holistically, they get to give you one of the best perspectives, the best judgments about, hey, could you really be this? Um, when I received the call for pastoral ministry, I rejected it. I was like, that cannot be true, right? But when I shared it with my close friends, uh, which was my D group equivalent, they all like, yeah, we saw it coming. I was like, no way, you know? Um, but that's where you can get the best confirmation. That's where you can share. And um, because this is a new paradigm, I think it's so important for us to walk through life together. Um, and I was, I'm doing chapter one now with a new group five of us, and in lesson five, it talks about unity in Christ as one of the topics. 
right? And we are supposed to help one another, one another, one another, one another. So D group, if you want to join, this is the link over here. Join D group. So I've come to the end of my presentation for the workshop. And uh, for the rest of the time, I'll open the floor up to questions and discussions. Okay, first, right. Lionel, there's a request for you to show the slide for A and P again. Okay. Yeah, just for a moment so that people can have a look at it. A and also slide P for A pass. Okay. Thank you. Buona. In the meantime, uh, just the questions that maybe uh, that, that's been brought out, that we're going to just talk a little bit. Can, uh, can those of you who want have questions, maybe you can message uh, your, so if you have a question, put one, two, three, four uh, on, the, on the chat, then we'll see by the, the sequence. But anyway, there's a question that, that maybe I'll sum it up is, is it possible that, that we can nurture some of these gifts? And uh, you know, some were more naturally uh, inclined or God gifted that to us as who we are. Is it possible to nurture another gift intentionally? What do you, what, what's your understanding, uh, Pastor Lionel? I think, I think it's a yes and no. It's not like because you're not gifted in it, you can never be good at it, mm. right? Like, I mean, just talk about shepherding, which is a big thing in our church right now. Uh, I'm not shepherding doesn't mean I cannot try to be nice and I shouldn't continue to work on that. Um, but it just means the first thought in my mind is, is really to move forward and to push forward, is to innovate. So I think yes and no. And sometimes I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold too precious to my giftings because like what Pastor James said, they can change based on circumstance um, and necessity and circumstance. So it's not a hard and fast rule, um, but generally as you move along life and if you're a young Christian or if you've not been in ministry for a long time, I encourage you do this test, try out, but at the same time test are based on experience. So if you have little experience, right, your data is definitely going to be a little skewed. Uh, so continue to, to explore and to go out there and to, you know, and do the test again. If you need a test again, let me know, uh, but just don't distribute it, all right? So this is A and P that I have over here. Is this a slide that that person was looking for? I think so. I think so. I think okay. So. Okay, so uh, there's also another question about uh, corporate mission and individual mission. I will actually ask that you, <laughs> this is like, like sorry, I'm stealing your workshop to promote mine. I am actually talking about this specific question in my workshop next week. So if you are interested in individual mission versus corporate mission and a discussion about that, uh, join workshop five <laughs> next week, <laughs> workshop five. Uh, it's actually, it's covered in Ephesians five. And I think that's the amazing thing. Paul is kind of like the Holy Spirit inspired Paul that he's reading our mind. Because as we read chapter 4 and what you presented, the natural question comes. And the question that's being asked, some of them are actually going to be answered in chapter 5 of Ephesians, which we'll be sharing next Sabbath morning and in my workshop next week. So don't worry, hang in there. We'll talk a little bit more about that and uh, definitely answer the question about the corporate and individual. Uh, and there's some question pertaining to the, the Adventist church corporate structure. Uh, we are not here to comment on that. We're not here to criticize that. Uh, we hear your comment. We, we see uh, some of the challenges we have in the church. We are a part of it. We understand the challenges, but we're not here to correct anything. I don't think things can change by uh, negative, critical mind just of one or two person. I think it was to work together, embrace our gifts, and work together to change things. I think I, I, I have a friend who, who, who met up with me last week to talk about church and all that. And I always remind him, uh, I remind him, the Adventist church is at the moment 25 million people, about 25 million people. And I said, you know, in Singapore right now, we're about 5 million people, a bit more, uh, 5 to 6 million people. And we do have Institute of Mental Health, we do have Changi Prison, we do have hospitals, like that in a 5 million 
population country, we already have people of different challenges and different uh, needs and uh, problems and uh, corruption and all that is is normal. All the more in the Adventist church is five times that number. So I don't think uh, it's realistic to expect everybody to be 100% okay all the time. Uh, so I think, you know, to, to, to talk about the church, we have to realize the church is not the administration, it's all 25 million of us. Right, Lino? I don't know whether you agree with what I just said. Yep, I agree. And, and actually, based on the title of this workshop, From More Hierarchy to More Missionaries, right? It's not from hierarchy to missionaries. It's just that our tilt, because maybe we've been waiting for, for you know, whichever church leader and we don't want to stand out, or, or maybe we, we don't want to be the one that they'll arrow, right? Or they'll mark, right? I mean, if... You share a good idea, then naturally you're the one that might have to do it. It's like, oh, better keep quiet. You know, sometimes I see that happen. And so we actually rock the church of maybe becoming more holistic. And so that means, um, which is why one of the challenges is personal trust issues. Trust that God will empower you to do what you need to. And um, I don't think there's anything wrong with hierarchy. In fact, I think it's because we have an institution that's why our work could grow. That's why the church decided to institutionalize back in the day. And because we have institution, um, there are many things that we have that are still protected, you know. Whereas if we were independent in churches, things might not have gone so smoothly for all of us, right? So there is a place for that. But what this workshop is here to say is there is also another place which is called missions. And both have to work hand in hand. If not, um, we run into trouble. Yeah. Amir, so another question here that say what if what if that uh, your your gifting clash there's a conflict there's a conflict is it possible uh yeah what, what are your thoughts on that um so far in our experience of doing it there has not been a clash so the five the five apex giftings are made to work hand in hand they should not clash. Yes, they have weaknesses, but it's not a... Don't think of it as extremely digital. If you're good at this, then you're bad at that. If you're good at this, it's just a tendency. If all of us are just apostles, that will be the kind of community that will happen where we don't really care so much about people. So, so it's not like they are not complementary. They, they are made to be complementary. So if you have two clashing ones, I think it's the best. That means... You have the strength that overcomes the weakness of the other. So you should be more balanced than, than you know, um, some others that may be uh, more aligned in, in certain ways. Yeah, and I don't think uh, individually, like for me personally, I don't have the clash experience. But I think there is a, in a team, especially I know you've mentioned, and there's differences. And it may seem like a clash, but uh, I would like to call it a strong discussion. And I think in the strong discussion, the plan that comes up become more robust. Because we cover all paradigm, because I am definitely biased towards my evangelistic bands and your apostolic bands. There's different bands that we have. And then when we discuss it, we, uh, we learn about the other areas of consideration. And then when the plan is, is presented, it, it's more holistic. Uh, that's my experience. All right, is there any other question? Let me see. I don't, I don't think there's any serious question. Okay, uh, maybe, maybe there's a, I think I can phrase this question this way. Uh, I think for, for Lino, I, I'm pretty sure you, you fought against the calling to be a pastor, the calling to be a pastor. Uh, do you, how do you know? <laughs> this is a big one, right? How do you know it's a calling? that God is calling you to this thing or that thing. Um, you shared that the confirmation, the external, the people around you who can tell you and share with you. But what if I, I, I go, it, go into it and I, I, I believe it's a calling, but I realize it's not. Then what do I do? Uh, any, any ideas? Wait, so your question is, you believe it's a calling, but it's not. But you suspect, you suspect. It's not proven, but you think, oh, Maybe you, if you feel like, oh, I called to be apostolic, to be a church planter. Then when you go and actually do it, you feel like, oh, actually, it's, could, it's not really. Is it possible that that can happen? Um, well, 
I mean, to use that example, I don't think God only can use apostle like gifted people to plant churches. Um, I think God can use, God is not limited in that. It's just that he's given us a sweet spot, right, for certain work. Um, the second is, I don't see what's the harm in trying, provided you didn't ignore all the warning signals and all the warning bells, and then you got it wrong. I mean, you know, I've seen a lot of people that stumble into mistakes only to, to because of that mistake, lead them into where they are now and they, 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 are, they are working in their sweet spot in ministry and all that. So, so I don't think it's, it's so digital. Uh, and that's the, the thing I want to push forward to. It's not like, oh, I made a mistake. That's it for me. You know, I've, I've wandered out of God's calling. I think God is bigger than that. And that's the first thing that we have to realize. Um, and so pertaining to my pastoral ministry, yeah, I didn't want to. But if you are honest with yourself, right before you sleep at night, sometimes I, I call it the mystery of God, right? There is this prompting inside. It's like this burden that is growing in your heart for a certain thing. And, uh, but that type of calling is a calling to do a specific task, to enter into a specific place. Um, the gifted calling is, is another, is, is a intrinsic, you know, uh, not implicative. I'm, I think I'm trying too big a word. It's not a functional calling. It's to call you to be a certain person, you know, be an evangelist for me, share with all your friends, bravely, courageously. I've given you the talent to convince, you know, go out and tell your friends, maybe that you're struggling, what they are doing is wrong. Hey, I see a certain habit in love, tell them it's wrong. Prophetic, you know, shepherding, there's these two people in church that are just left out. Love them like the way I love you. So, so that is, is, you know, not really a functional like now and be this, but live a life to focus and, and, and in this strength. Yep. So I think the, the, at the end of the day, I think we must remind ourselves it's a grace and love driven thing that church is not about uh, your success, my failure, you are right, I am wrong, so much so as the, let us try to work towards being more like Jesus and uh, serve God, serve others, serve people. Of course, there's a, we need to learn more about Jesus that guides us in the correct way of serving others and serving God. Uh, you know, back down to the question of loving God and loving others. We have one minute left and I'll, I think we'll end with this last question. Uh, again, you can still send in questions, I think, and then we'll, we'll answer it as and when, maybe in our next session and all that. But uh, I can email Pastor Lionel uh, personally. So the last question that is a clarification, I think, is is it different from a spiritual gift inventory? What's the difference between a past and a spiritual gift inventory? I think um, spiritual gift inventory is a lot more specific. Uh, and the problem, I, I, no, I don't say problem. The shortfall of spiritual gift inventory is there are some questions that half of us will never have the experience. So you never know. And actually, if you want to have a very accurate gifting of spiritual gift inventory, you have to do it very frequently. Uh. Every time you walk into a new experience, you should do it again. Which is, uh, it's not that it's wrong or, or it's what. It's just that because it's so specific, um, it has its shortfalls. Um, so APES to me is good because it's broad enough, right? And uh, so, so it gives you that playroom to, to kind of massage and to feel. Um, so I, that's, that's, I think, the biggest um, pro for, for APES. Uh, James, do you have anything to add? <laughs> what? Sorry, I'm not laughing at you. I'm just laughing at a very cute boy. He's very funny. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with what you said. Uh, and I think on that note, we are going to end here because it's 3.30, the time we have. Uh, we're going to not keep everybody on our workshop. I think if we're going to keep on talking, Lana and I can talk to you 7 o'clock and you can still join us if you want. But I think... What we're sharing here right now is to get you to think about this, to start thinking about this. Uh, this is just one hour of a workshop. Uh, in fact, you only had like 40 minutes to present. Uh, I, I guess your class was a lot longer than just 40 minutes. Um, so it's for you to start thinking about this, to relook at your church and your ministry, 
and to, to look into it more, right? It's a, it's a journey we're beginning that is under the bigger idea of this discipleship congress. And again, we're going to re-emphasize that uh, you, you can start experiencing using all these gifts, all these tendencies uh, by participating in the D group. I think that's a very good place to start. Uh, shall we end with a word of prayer? And uh, I'll get Lionel to pray for us. We'll close us with prayer. All right, shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for having us, uh, for having you, Lord, as our head and our leader and our God. And uh, more than that, we, are, we just feel so privileged and honoured that you have called us into partnership with you, Lord, for your mission on earth. As flawed as we are, as sinful as we are, Lord, you have still given us gifts and I just pray that for all of us here in this room, Lord, that as we uh, continue in ministry, as continue to be part of your body, Lord, that you and uh, we take our APES giftings, that you will give us the courage, you give us the wisdom to uh, develop this skill, give us um, um, the insight and the vision to apply it properly into our churches. May we work with our leaders well, uh, work with our pastors well, Lord, that truly, Lord, that as we look, uh, as we enter into a new normal, Lord, as we look at the, um, the pains of this world, that our church can truly be your body, Lord, that, uh, you know, where you call us to go, we'll be full, we'll be strong and be mature enough to enter, Lord, and to truly bring about a wave of healing, of restoration, and to share your good news in a much needed world today, Lord. So we thank you for everything. We thank you for this amazing Sabbath that you have, Lord, that you've reminded us of so much and that you are there with us all the time, Lord. And we love you and we thank you for everything. In your most precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Have a good rest of the Sabbath. Thank you. Uh, again, reminder that this video, this workshop and the next, and the workshop of the other workshop that you miss is all available as recording on our uh, uh, SAC YouTube channel and also our Facebook. Take care. Have a good day. See you guys. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Bye. Bye.